Hello and welcome to tonight's program. My name is Lee Pfeffer. I am the manager of museum experience with the GLBT Historical Society and I thank you for joining us tonight. I want to start by acknowledging that the GLBT Historical Society is based on Ohlone tribal land. I invite any indigenous folks with us today to make themselves visible in the chat and be recognized as we honor the contemporary and ancestral lives of America's indigenous peoples. This event is being recorded and will be posted to our YouTube channel and to our website on the past events page. If you're watching live with us, we welcome your active participation in the chat and encourage you to post comments, observations, and questions for our participants. And before I turn it over to tonight's host, I just want to tell you a little bit about the society and the work that we do in case you aren't familiar with us. Founded in 1985, the Gay, Lesbian, Bisexual, Transgender, or GLBT Historical Society is recognized internationally as a leader in the field of LGBTQ public history. Our mission is to collect, preserve, exhibit, and make accessible to the public materials and knowledge to support and promote understanding of LGBTQ history, culture, and arts in all their diversity. Our operations are centered around two sites. We have the GLBT Historical Society Museum located in the heart of San Francisco's Castro neighborhood since 2011. Uh, we've been closed for a couple of weeks just because of the Omicron surge, but we will be reopening the museum on Wednesday, uh, February 23rd. So we welcome you back into that space. And then we also have the Dr. John P. DeCecco Archives and Research Center, who uh, our three guests tonight are uh, intimately familiar with. We'll be giving you a nice little kind of virtual tour through that. And that is in the Mid Market District in downtown San Francisco. You can check out our growing array of exhibitions, events, and archival resources online at glbthistory.org. And finally, I just wanted to thank all of our members and donors who make our work possible. If you're not already a card-carrying member of the Society, I invite you to consider joining today. Members get a variety of cool perks, including a 20% discount on the website as well as in the uh, physical museum store. And you will get access to special members-only events and you get access to events like this as well as uh, just general admission to the museum for free for yourself and a guest. You can learn more about how to become a member and other ways that you can support the society by visiting glbthistory.org slash join dash give. And thank you again for being here. And I'm going to introduce our host for the evening. Uh, if you've been to one of these before, you have seen him many a time. Uh, I would love to bring on Ramon Silvestre. Uh, he's the museum registrar and curatorial specialist and is an expert in material culture studies. He previously was a visiting fellow at the Smithsonian's natural, National Museum of Natural History and has published in many national and international professional journals, including the Smithsonian Institution Scholarly Press. 
He holds a PhD in anthropology and a master's degree in curatorial and museum studies from the University of Arizona School of Anthropology. He has conducted fieldwork and museum collection acquisitions among the Kalina, uh, Kalinga and if Ifuago, uh, if Ifugao tribes, you're gonna have to correct me on that, uh, Ramon, in Northern Philippines, the Iban in Indonesia and the Dayak in Borneo. So let's welcome on a uh, very impressive resume, Ramon. Hello. Well, thank you very much for that um, illustrious welcome. <laughs> I am joined as well with two more illustrious archivists and panelists I will introduce to you later. And they'll probably introduce themselves, but first and foremost, thank you all for finding time to join us tonight on our fourth Curiosity Corner program. Um, and for those who are just joining us for the first time, the Curiosity Corner is a quarterly program series that showcases treasured items, what most of us in museum and archives folks call material culture, Spe specific from the Historical Society's collection of things like art, objects, and papers that my, again, evening's illustrious panel and I would love to share with you all. Um, we explore a few select items, um, most of which have never been either shown on, on an exhibit or may have been featured in exhibit a few years ago. And uh, that basically is the whole point in doing this little show and tell thing. But anyway, so in this series, like the last one, we also featured conversations with other art um, and queer historians and museum professionals on things like curation best practices and have collaborated with other institutions, all in hoping for a delightfully entertaining evening of show and tell. Nothing too formal, but with the hopes of just having a fun, thank God it's Friday evening. So. Welcome to tonight's show. And before anything else, I would like to thank again, Lee Pfeffer, our tech guru, and uh, for tonight and the last few evening programs that Lee has been so generously managed because without them, I would be dead in water. And then of course, let me just introduce my panel, Historical Society Archivists, um, Isaac Fellman, who is our reference archivist, and Megan Needles, who is our project archivist. So I am sure they will chime in soon as we, soon as I get over my little kind of project. So, uh, <clears throat> and of course myself, your program host, um, not sure how illustrious I might be, but okay, we are moving on. For those who may have not visited our relatively new space on Market Street, I mean, new to some, I mean, we've, we've been here for over five years, I think, Isaac and everyone else. Um, um, let me, uh, from our old mission address, which was Kitty Corner from the Museum of Modern Art. So let me start with, let me start to invite you to a quick virtual tour an itinerary through the archive storage and share with you our workspace. Underneath the hustle and bustle of traffic on Market Street, train trolleys, buses, that sort of thing, lives in a lower level storage. I I, it's a special term for the basement, an amazing collection of stored historical material that is the historical society. Um, we try our best to keep up with managing the constant flow of materials and the archivists are busy processing, accessioning collections, collectively conserving and preserving almost endless cartons of material culture that have come our way. So let me work on my slide rack. So as you can see that, I hope you can see all of that. We try our best to uh, keep things in order. Um, with the pandemic, we had to put our acquisitions, donations, and our valued volunteers on hold until it was safe to staff for the staff to come in and we still are currently playing catch up and really careful keeping stag staggered schedules when we need to be at the archives not mentioning they have to work especially isaac and megan 
uh, work with researchers as well that have set appointments to come in to work with collections. A big hand and a shout out to my illustrious panel of archivists for all their hard work that they do. So my archivists can chime in whenever you desire. But um, tonight we wanted to show you what our favorite items or favorite items were. And let me just go through. Oh, did I screw up? Have we passed those slides yet? Yes, I have. So um, tonight we wanted to show you our favorite objects or just you know, artifacts that may have recently been donated or we may have just happened to come across in the treasure trove that is the Historical Society's archive collection. Um, I would also like to thank you all for your continued interest in what we do and supporting the society with the hopes that you all find interesting personal papers or come across them and all sorts of fun items to come our way and eventually we can share that with you. Um, yourselves and the community has helped increase the treasures we have acquired through the years and have shed light on some of these works, which all pay tribute to the queer movement. And for that reason, there are times not much is not is known about some of the work that we present. And so we would love for you all to feel free to add your comments on the chat or send me an email or whenever you get a chance to do that. So um, maybe what we'll do is let me introduce Megan and Isaac first, and then we'll get back to me and present my favorite pick. So go ahead, Isaac and Megan. Say hello to everyone. <laughs> hey, everybody. Um, I'm Isaac, the reference archivist. Uh, so uh, I work with the public uh, in the reading room when folks come to visit and do research. Uh, I also do a lot of processing and cataloging of collections behind the scenes. Um, it, it's all sort of to the purpose of helping people when they're in, whether it's to organize their visit in advance or giving them advice and slinging them boxes when they arrive. Hey everyone. Um, yeah, my name is Megan Needles and I am the project archivist. Thanks Ramon for the lovely intro. Um, yeah, and I am currently working on an NHPRC funded um, project to process and also digitize 10 performing arts collections in the archive. And um, yeah, the collections cover, you know, people like political singer-songwriters and disco DJs um, and, you know, drag theater groups so, and uh, choruses. So it's like a wide variety of different um, kinds of performing arts uh, folks and, and groups. And yeah, it's been really fun and I'm happy to be here. Well, thank you. So um, let me go on to my pick tonight. Um, is one specific to LGBTQ queer architectural spaces that I wanted to feature that I found quite fascinating and quite artistic. Um, I had these pieces um, in an earlier exhibition curated by our Elizabeth Cornu. He, she uh, just um, she had retired from the De Young as, and as a senior conservator, and we had it on display at the Castro location. I think maybe in 2012 or 2013. And <clears throat> in as much as I had very limited space, we were only able to install four panels rather than the, the, rather than the 10 panels we had in the collection. And I would love to install the 10 panels in an exhibit and hopefully in the near future, we could do that. So uh, without further ado, drum roll please. I will present to you the legendary bulldog bath murals. So this slide just shows you a, this is the, the plaque that sits on the street and the postcard on the left is an advertising postcard for the bathhouse in the early, late seventies. So, um, so fascinating were these murals that were saved from one of the first San Francisco bathhouses that opened sometime in 1978, then shortly closed in 1983. It was located at the 130 Turk Street. The site had previously housed the Club Turkish Baths in San Francisco, its first gay bathhouse, 
that was established in the early 1930s um, with historical reference from a Mattachine Society 1954 convention guidebook, uh, a national homophile organization, characterized the facilities as real plush. Uh, starting in 1979, the new Bulldog branding emphasized the virile working class sexual allure that reflected commercialized fantasy more than it characterized the actual clientele. Thus the uh, postcard that is being featured in the slide. Um, the, they redecorated the interior, which included an orgy room with these murals by a New York artist named Brooke Jones. The Bulldog Baths closed in 1984 as a result of the declining business at the height of the AIDS crises. So um, this piece of amazing ephemera, a postcard and advertising the Tenderloin Bathhouse, depicts a working class hunk mounted on the hood of a truck. Though this postcard is undated, we assume it's in the late 70s. Um, I'm not sure if mounted is a good choice of words, but here it is. Um, the postcard is in our current exhibit at the museum in the, in the Castro under Gaberhoods. So at the archives, and let me go to the next slide, um, <clears throat> is a film documentary by Molly Hogan, uh, more like a guided tour of the space before it was taken down. <clears throat> it's a walk through the back the bathhouse with the former owner of the baths, at which point the bath murals, um, I'm sorry, former owner of the baths after they shortly took the space down, at which point the bath murals came to the historical society. The artwork that was left behind on the walls reminds me personally of, I know it's ancient Italy, it's ancient Italy, remains of frescoes from the brothels of Pompeii. I know, um, the, the walls, the frescoes left on the wall are really fascinating, but these erotic frescoes, similar to the bulldog bath murals, was the soul of commerce of the brothels of Pompeii and the actual bulldog baths. It was the appealing advertising element used to popularize the baths, co coincided with the erotica found on the walls, a parallel in my opinion. Um, so the bulldog bath is remembered for its realistic prison decor and popularized with the man's man atmosphere. So let me pull up the photographs of these murals. They're pretty explicit. And, and so um, I'm sure uh, Lee had, had um, warned me that Facebook might take it down, but we'll see. Uh, so there, there are approximately 10 panels on sheetrock um, um, and um, <clears throat> it is about four, four, four and a half feet wide by 10 feet tall. And since there are 10 panels, that's 50 linear feet of murals. So I think it's, it's, it's pretty amazing. So um, I couldn't present um, the entire 10, well, I'm, I'm showing you all 10 panels, but I couldn't show the, like the entire 10 panels in one slide because I, I, could, I just couldn't fit it, fit it in the screen. So here's one and it's, I hope you see some of the detail. Um, it's fairly, um, as I said, erotic. And so here are five of the panels and I'll give you a few minutes to um, kind of look at the slide and uh, you can tell me if I can go on to the next one. Um, let me pull the next one. And so I am reading through the chat, Gail Rubin, thank you so much for joining us, Gail, because Gail and Mike Caffey were my, my, uh, my historical references to a lot of the of the pieces I'm talking about tonight. And uh, Yale said, a bunch of us pulled these murals out of the bathhouse as it was closing. There was a lot of a lot else, including a large cage, which 
alas, has disappeared. And yes, I would have loved to have had the cage sent to us. Uh, previous to the bathhouse, previous to this, previous to this, I was asked by the owners of, this was about maybe a couple years ago already, the, the Knob Hill Cinema owners had called and said um, they were closing, they had sold the property. So they had called to find out if I needed anything from, from the site. So I went and visited and I picked up a lot of things. So I could actually recreate one of the uh, the actual cubicles with with the screen, the, the, the video screen. I got the seat, the seat covers and all the posters from the from the porn stars that were featured in the theater. And hopefully that makes another exhibit in the near future. So here is another set of panels. This is three of the panels. And then, uh, and then here is, oh, I was able to get, see it's, it's really small. So I'm not sure if you can see that in your, in your computer screen, but, um, the particularly interesting artifact detail in this display is the painting showing a row of, a row of semi-trailer trucks dimly visible in the blue background, which was the first slide I showed you. And this was one of the more PG-13 sections of a mural that covered all walls of the orgy room at the Bulldog Baths. Um, so, uh, The same, I mean, yeah, Turk Street also has, if you're not familiar with San Francisco, Turk, Turk Street also is is, is where uh, the Compton Cafeteria was located and is best known today as the home of Aunt Charlie's. Um, so the Bulldog Bath is now famous and, and, and is now registered in the National Register of Historic Places and its location marked with the black that I had shown you a little earlier. Um, so the little descriptions I have is the bathhouse contained four floors with the entry on the second floor. A mid-level bar featured the bulldog version of a hot backroom bar, complete with a pool table, the murals, a flashing neon sign, and a giant video screen that showed a steady stream of sports films uh, Bus Benz, also a supporter of the Historical Society and former owner of the of Club Aero, said that although the Bulldog was a large gay bathhouse, it was not the largest in the world since gay bathhouses were prominent in the 70s, both in Europe and the United States. Um, uh, Gail was one of the several folks from the Historical Society uh, <clears throat> that were given permission to undertake the salvage operations and uh, and it became the early collections of the historical society. Um, I think that's it for now. Um, can I ask Megan to chime in now with her? <laughs> yeah, Great. sure. Although I think there might be one more slide. Oh, do you know what? I'm sorry, I missed yeah. that one slide. Sorry, and here is, oops. pressing the wrong button. So here is the locker sign. And then we were, I, in the collection, we have the lockers, oops, sorry. The lockers and the uh, tokens that were in the lockers, right? Yeah, the, uh, yes. So I think we're, I hope everybody sees these. So in it are tokens and keys. Oh, there's a key in the, yeah, I'm sorry. It's really tiny from my end. So the key to the lockers are right there in front. So we have really interesting artifacts from the bulldog baths and there's more in the collection. So if you ever find time to come visit us, um, you set an appointment with Isaac and we can pull some of the collection, some of them. Yes, some of the artifacts and show them to you. So, um, oh, sorry, Megan. No, that's okay. <laughs> <That's> um, <your> <laughs> that was great. Um, 
you did so much research so such good research and i feel like uh comparatively i'm i'm kind of doing more of like a casual uh show and tell but still got some cool items to show you nevertheless um so yeah uh like i said before i am working on an nhprc funded grant i'm working with um, performing arts collections. And this has been a really informative project for me to work on. Um, I have a background in audiovisual preservation. Um, so I never really had the opportunity to consider how things like furniture and neon signs and set pieces and um, wigs and things like um, should be preserved. Um, so a lot of the items I will be sharing with you today, one are items that I've been working with as part of this project and also items that I found unique in that sense and that I think kind of fall outside of what you would traditionally expect or think you would um, find like in a traditional archives, things where you would, uh, or a place where you would definitely find like administrative records or like maybe some photographs. These definitely um, are a little more out there and, and cool. Um, so yeah, the first collection I'll talk about is the Finocchio's collection. Um, and these are two large format photographs um, that are part of the collection. Um, on the left is David Alba, and on the right is Walter Hart. Um, and I'm sure um, a lot of people on this call are familiar with Finocchio's, but um, just for a little background information, um, Finocchio's was one of the earliest queer spaces in San Francisco and also one of the best known female impersonation um, clubs in the world. Uh, it opened in the late 20s or early 1930s in then Bohemian North Beach. And um, during Prohibition, uh, Finocchio's started featuring um, for female impersonation um, shows, which became wildly popular. And eventually, Finocchio's became um, so well known, it served as a model uh, for other female impersonation clubs uh, in the United States. Um, and at the time, Finocchio's was popular um, both amongst the queer community. Um, queer people would go there to you know, meet each other, um, particularly gay men. Um, and queer people also worked and performed um, at the club. Uh, but it was also popular um, amongst tourists. I think at the time, the kind of bohemian lifestyle was uh, romanticized and, um, you know, attractive to tourists. And so Finocchio's was like one of the go-to clubs um, in North Beach if you wanted to see that scene in action. Um, so, we oh. Yeah, and so these are just some artifacts, um, presumably from the dressing room at Finocchio's that were um, collected after Finocchio's um, closed in 1999. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, so from left to right, um, there is a wig head and a um, hairpiece ponytail in the middle, a uh, fake eyelashes, um, and on the right, kind of an assortment of different artifacts, a um, necklace, a folding fan, and a uh, blush applicator box. Um, and yeah, I just think it's really wonderful that these things are have found a home in our archives. And, you know, I think you might think that these things might have been overlooked at other kind of more mainstream archives. And, um, you know, and it, I think it's just really lovely that they're being preserved at uh, and uh, at the GLBT Historical Society. Um, and I also am really intrigued by the uh, severed cut in half hairpiece. Uh, I really wanna know like what the story is behind that. Um, maybe it was part of an act or like uh, a performer just got really enraged one night and um, cut the, the piece in half, I don't know. But uh, I think it's great that we can um, you know, they're here in the archive and we can imagine what happened there. Um, and then uh, the next collection I will talk about is the Thrill Peddlers collection. Um, and the Thrill Peddlers uh, were a San Francisco based multi-generational queer theater company specializing in Grand Guignol plays and theater of the ridiculous. So their productions were gory and raunchy and um, funny 
and they sound really amazing. Um, and they also stage revivals of Coquette's musicals. Um, the Hypnodrome Theater, which is was in Soma, um, was the Thrill Peddler's home for many years uh, before they closed in 2017. And yeah, so here I just have um, a set piece uh, on the left there and a headpiece, like part of a costume. And both of these are from um, the hot uh, production of Hot Greeks. And Hot Greeks was originally written for the Coquettes. Um, and I just think, yeah, these are like both really amazing pieces. I think the attention to detail um, is incredible. And although Throw Peddlers was known for being really campy and like kind of low budget, the skill is clearly there. The craftsmanship is clearly there. Um, the headpiece on the right, I love. Like the more I look at it, um, the more, you know, I started to notice like what items they were using to construct this and design it. And that's like a colander that they just cut the bottom out of and then took like kind of, you know, common use crafts foam and like a tape measure and made this really incredible piece. Um, and Hot Greeks is available on YouTube, Throw Peddlers Hot Greeks. You can watch the full thing if anyone is interested in doing that. Um, I got to watch a little bit and I found out that, so we have three of those uh, similar but slightly different head pieces and they each um, represent the three different kind of styles of Greek architecture, like the different tops of the columns in Greek architecture. Um, so yeah, that's just a little context for what that is. Um, and then <laughs> I had to share these uh, because I think they're really amazing and um, kind of fun. Um, but the Thrill Peddlers worked in the horror and sci-fi genre. And so they used um, you know, a lot of special effects props um, in their productions. And these are just two, there's a whole bunch in the collection. Um, these are like the PG-13 <laughs> uh, special effects props that I could find because there are definitely some rated R ones in there too. Um, and I am pretty sure uh, on the, the severed limb on the right, I'm pretty sure that has like real, <laughs> hair on it or if it's not real it looks very real it's very convincing um and yeah so those are my uh items oh i think the next slide um ramon if you want to pop oh, hang on. back so, on yeah cool so yeah not to mention the thrill peddlers we have a huge theater sign that is stored in the back mm -hmm. it's probably like 10 feet 10 feet long yeah, at least, yeah. At least that much. And so I am so thankful Megan has joined us because um, Megan has been really cleaning up the backlog of our work along with Isaac. And, you know, without without them, I, I'm not sure exactly, you know, how would we how we would manage these these collections that we've had for at least a couple of years, if not more. So I am, you know, thank you. Thank you again. I can't thank you enough. But anyway, so moving on, we, Megan and Megan and of course Megan and I have been trying to clean up some of the collection along with, with with the rest of the projects that Megan has been working on. But this one is specific to the Sylvester collection. So um, as you all well know, we have a Sylvester collection that was given to us first by um, the project Open Hand. Am I? wrong there i may be wrong but the no that's right sylvester also sister bernadette had reached out to us um a few years back and the former managing archivist and i flew to los angeles um southern california to meet with her and collect a few more personal memorabilia from sylvester's family and home but the most amazing pieces and i shouldn't say most but the most the most interesting pieces i guess are the sequined suit suit pantsuits that that sylvester had worn had worn during performances and we just both discovered megan and i that it was designed by 
Pat Campano. And unfortunately, we don't know more about Pat, but what we know is um, he was the designer, and I would assume he, I'm not sure as well, but I, it's just my, my guess. Um, he also was a designer to uh, Supreme, so you know, Diana Ross and that kind of thing, that group, before they all broke up, I guess, into individual performers. And then was it Finocchio's as well, Megan? Yeah, and the Finocchio's collection, I found that there were a number of Pat Campano pieces in there as well. So it seemed like their work was kind of prolific it's and a lot amazing. of people knew about right. it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, you know, the next, then having to provide provenance is always such a tricky thing. And so we reach out to people that might have come across the name or the person or that sort of thing. So, you know, we just need you guys to kind of reach out to us and we we can piece the puzzle together with all your help and um oh and also uh, we wanted to just mention that february is uh black history month and so it was a little tribute to kind of feature sylvester's um costumes is that it for slides making for sylvester i wasn't sure yeah i think so i think next is um, bring in, so bring we, in Isaac on, yeah. We, we welcome Isaac uh, to the hey everybody to the panel. Um, I was just reading in the background about Pat Campano. Uh, you, you did gender him correctly. Uh, the thing that really interested me to learn is that uh, he had a creative partner who was a drag queen, and uh, like who inspired the campiness of the uh, of the costumes. Just the two of them worked hand in hand. That's amazing. I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah, it's it's just, I I never cease to learn things about our collections, uh, even the stuff that I have seen a fair amount. Yep. Um, yeah, so uh, I guess it's Isaac time. Um, I'm just going to talk about a couple of collections that uh, we have either recently taken in or I have recently had on my mind uh, for various reasons. Uh, the first one that I wanted to show off is a photo album from the Denise Deanne papers. Uh, Denise was um, an incredible force of nature. Uh, she was a trans woman who was very active in San Francisco politics uh, since uh, really the, the early 70s. Uh, she transitioned in 68 and uh, not, not only did was you know her life restarted and, and she was reborn in this way, uh, but she also experienced this huge, like, emotional and political revolution where she, uh, you know, she sort of went from being like a fairly conservative, fairly apolitical person to uh, becoming a radical leftist and embracing all kinds of environmental and union causes. Uh, you know, she was just incredibly active on behalf of all the things that she believed in. Uh, the way that I think I put it in the thing that I just wrote for the newsletter about her, like, I really, really feel this. It's not just a bit. Uh, that Denise felt such incredible gender euphoria for the past 50 years of her life. Uh, and, and like just all of that energy just went into doing all of the work that she did. Like uh, she, she just had so much joy to spare at being Denise that she could only express it by arguing for, you know, better care and stewardship of the earth. So, um, so in the late 60s, when Denise was transitioning, she hung out with this group of folks who like mostly I would say identified as trans women, like some of them might have seen themselves more in, in the cross-dresser or queen area of the spectrum, but people moved back and forth a lot in those days. Cer- certainly Denise did. Um, and uh, this group of folks called themselves the Girl Factory. Uh, they hung out with this older trans woman who had decided not to transition. Um, she felt, you know, it was, It was a harder and more stringent and intense time, to put it mildly, to attempt to secure access to medical transition. And uh, there was a very strong culture of of not doing it if you felt like you weren't going to pass, you know, if you felt like you weren't going to be a person who looked like a cis woman. And so this older woman thought that, you know, I'm not going to pass. I don't want to do this. I'm going to keep living as a man, but I'm going to fund the transitions of younger trans women who I feel would be able to uh, to come out of this on the other side and be happier than I would be. And so it's it's an interesting story. I, I I can't think about this person's life without a lot of sorrow, but 
also she made a lot of people very happy. Um, so I found this photo album in Denise's papers and it's full of uh, pictures, you know, like of just exquisite and beautifully quaffed and styled uh, folks who I assume are trans women in the late 60s. Uh, they're, they're just sort of wearing, you know, like the hair with the flip, um, just everything to the nines. Uh, I should go back a slide. Uh, that, that is Denise on the far right in the, in the green suit. Um, when, when Denise was picking up guys in, in queen bars uh, to take home, uh, she, she wrote in her autobiography, which was called Male Facade, uh, that uh, they always responded to her as a lady. She was very proud of being elegant and classy. And so like, she really exudes that. Um, I, I don't know that this represents the girl factory. It is from exactly the same time. And I feel like I recognize the people that she's describing in Male Facade because she gives them very vivid descriptions, many of them very unflattering. Uh, Denise had a sharp tongue and uh, her collection also contains a good deal of satirical poetry about her coworkers that she didn't like. So like really um, just an incredible collection to work with, uh, a great pleasure. Um, another collection uh, that we took in fairly recently, I, I don't think we've had a chance to talk about it publicly very much. Uh, this is the, the papers of Beverly Shaw, although as you can see, these aren't papers, this is a gold lame suit. Um, so Beverly uh, was a nightclub singer. She performed at clubs like Mona's 440. Uh, later on, she had her own nightclub in Los Angeles, whose name I forget. Oh no, it had some kind of botanical theme. Uh, but like Beverly was a big draw. You know, she was a, um, she, she had like a larger than life, very sassy, very intense persona on stage. Uh, there are a few nice photos of her um, in our digital collections, actually. Um, there's one from the Wide Open Town Papers where she's like, she's like kneeling on the ground, like belting out a note, like just her mouth is wide open. She's giving it everything. Um, so Beverly's family gave us a bunch of her material. They also gave a bunch of uh, the One Archives uh, quite a bit of it uh, because her career was associated with both San Francisco and later LA. Uh, what I really like about this performance suit is that it's very clearly a combination of store-bought and handmade elements. Like it's glamor, it's high glam, but it is on a budget for the working gal. They are they are two, like you can see, different lames. Um, this the dress, uh, sorry, the jacket is off the rack, uh, and the, the the skirt though is uh, hand sewn. You know, you can look inside. You can see that the seams are finished, but they're not professionally finished. Um, I also really love, and you know, part of this is just the style of the time, I know, but uh, the, the jacket is like a few sizes bigger than the skirt. You can see from the skirt, she was a tiny woman, like a modern size two. But, um, you know, you, you can see that there's gender play at work in here because the fit of the jacket was quite a bit boxier, you know, it was more butch. So you, you can sort of see her like, uh, you know, flashing some leg and also, um, you, you know, throwing a bone to the idea of femininity while also expressing quite a bit of butch style. So uh, Beverly, um, we also have some really neat stuff, a, a record of hers, she did a commercial record and also a record that she pressed for her kids because uh, she had left her husband and her kids behind when she came out to San Francisco to become, you know, a professional singer and to be out. Uh, but she stayed in touch with her kids uh, and, you know, recorded music for them to uh, to stay connected. Um, the last person I want to talk about, um, I, I think uh, you might have seen, uh, we, we linked to it recently on our social media. Uh, one of our interns uh, wrote a great article about Sadie Sadie, the rabbi lady, uh, who was an early member of the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence. Um, so Sadie's theme was that she was a Jewish nun and, um, her collection is just, it's so good. We, so much of the sisters' materials went to their archives instead of ours. Um, I, we, we work with them fairly routinely. We're on good terms. It's not like I want their stuff, but it's really incredible to have something that I get to work with directly that is so close to the center of what the sisters did. Uh, so Sadie's real name, Gilbert Block, uh, best friends with Gilbert Baker for a long time. You know, they were the two Gilberts. Uh, many of the pictures of uh, Block in drag, um, the, sorry, 
Block, in case you don't know, the designer of the rainbow flag. Um, like, if you look at any picture of him from the 80s, uh, there, there's, like, Sadie is always right next to him. And she's always making, like, like that kind of face. Like, she's just so ecstatic to be standing next to Gilbert Block. And so they were members of the sisters. Um, anyway, Sadie also did uh, a lot of very political drag. Um, so this cheerleader outfit is from her time uh, campaigning for, um, oh my gosh, it's, it's actually kind of bad. I am not entirely conversant with this story. Basically, she was arguing against draining the Hetch Hetchy Reservoir and keeping San Francisco's power uh, more under local control. Um, I understand that there are environmental arguments like both for and against doing this. Uh, so there's a lot of nuance to the situation. But, you know, here she is as a cheerleader uh, advocating for power to the people, as you can see. Um, here is her also, she called it her synagogo hat. Um, th this expressed the, uh, the very strong Jewish identity that Sadie expressed in drag. Um, she had a lot of very Jewish themed drag. Um, God, uh, she had an outfit where, which like incorporated uh, English letters, but styled as if they were Hebrew letters that say fuck. Like it's very, it's very drag, it's very camp. Um, it's very powerful stuff. Um, the hat is like, you can see it in my hand, which is not a huge hand. Uh, you know, it's not a small hat, but like Sadie wore big wigs. So on top of the wigs, it's like a pillbox hat. It's It looks petite. Um, but uh, yeah, that combination of Judaism and disco, which is honestly like what I stand for as well. So I'm in broad support of Sadie Sadie and everything that she did. Um, I'm gonna turn back over to, oh, I spoiled it. Ramon is going to reveal this really cool other mural that we have just found and that Gail Rubin and Mike Caffey have helped us to authenticate. Uh, over to you, Ramon. So anyway, thank you, Isaac. And thank you, Megan, again. But I also wanted to do a small plug. Um, as you all well know, I was hoping you would, well, anyway. So Isaac is a Lambda Literary Award-winning writer. And this is why it is so much fun to have Isaac tell stories because it, it, it's amazing. And also, there's a small plug. He has a a um, book a book launch, right? Am I wrong? Oh, yes, I, no, I do. Uh, on February 22nd, uh, my novel, uh, Dead Collections, is coming out. It's about an archivist who's a vampire. See, so, and it's at the Green Apple? Yeah, yeah, the launch party is at Green Apple Books. And it's going, there's going to be a physical event as well as like, it'll be live streamed. So you can go if you are worried about COVID or just don't want to wear clothes. Um, we you know, but yeah, no, thank you, Ramon, for prompting me to, to uh, close my book. Anyway, so uh, back to segueing back to my my little reveal here. Um, I just wanted to kind of point out that we, in terms of architectural queer spaces in San Francisco, we don't seem to give these queer spaces, specifically your former gay bars or bathhouses, for that matter, the respect they deserve. After several prominent bars in San Francisco started closing shop, I would guess victims of modern current dating apps like Grindr and Scruff and whatever uh, whatever the new iterations of that are and of its time. Mapping a city's worth of shuttered lesbian and gay bars seems to be a worthwhile project that I know a, a few LGBTQ historians out there has have taken an interest on. So most of this research has shown a lost world of piano bars and bathhouses, butch femme discos, and you know be beachside gay hustlers, etc. Uh, one may come to realize how many of these battles the community fought, some won and lost, started in these bars and bathhouses, and how often bars served as a launching pad for our place claims where act activities became an identity. So they may not have had the respectability of the heteronormative bars, but bars were often the front lines of the community's earlier struggles. So which brings me to segue into the most recent, if not one of the more 
amazing historical finds we have come across with. Um, I just kind of wanted to let you all know that we are still piecing out all the exciting stories. And I have Gail Rubin and Mike Gaffey and everyone else trying to, you know, piece the, uh, the puzzle. But I think we do have uh, some provenance to this piece. So let me just pull out, uh, hang on, I need to figure out my slideshow here. Uh, drum roll, please, and do the reveal of this lost artifact of gay history. So here is the lost artifact of gay history. And I, again, will thank Gail and Mike for helping me out with this and also a few other people I would like to thank because without them we wouldn't have gotten this piece. This is a mural panel from the long demolished building that housed the famous toolbar, toolbox bar, let me refer, toolbox bar on 4th Street south of Market. It was made famous nationally on in a Life magazine article on June 26, 1964 entitled homosexuality in America. So um, 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 the uh, let me just read you an, a verb a, a, a note from the, the donors. Um, in this came from Jerry Sintara, who has been our long supporter at, and volunteer at the at the Historical Society. And <clears throat> Jerry Centara was a friend of the late David Ross and his partner, Antonio Perales. And in January 2021, um, Antonio called Jerry to ask for help in managing the estate of his recently deceased partner, David Ross. Um, Jerry had known David for many years and had met Antonio around 2007, while Jerry was preparing an exhibit at the Erotic Heritage Museum in Las Vegas, in which he intended to include one of David Ross's paintings. When I visited David, David and Antonio, I saw the back of the Arnett panel in David's storage room and heard its story. Apparently, he and Tony had been walking in the neighborhood of Cafe Floor when they came upon the panel amidst the goods at a garage sale. Recognizing its value, David bought it and have no idea how much, um, brought it up to the room and placed it carefully against some other large paintings <clears throat> in his storage. And there it remained for the next 30 or so years. So as part of, of Jerry's kindness and strategy to help with with, with managing the large collection of David Ross's work, he offered Tony to buy the panel for a donation to the Historical Society and on his behalf and the memory of David Ross. Thus, it has come to pass that it is now housed at the Historical Society. So this was the exciting reveal we wanted to share with you all. And I had to kind of, you know, dig around a little bit and with Gail Rubin and Mike Caffey's work um, and history. Um, as you well know, Mike Caffey is recognized as one of the earlier artists in the same article in the Life magazine as one of the artists in San Francisco of that time. And of course, Gail Rubin is a professor at the University of Michigan at Ann Arbor and has been my mentor and colleague and is the expert in the South of Market's leather community. So, and I know Gail's there listening. So thank you again. I was hoping one of these days, I'm gonna have Mike and Gail as our guest. And that way we could chat a lot more about these things because they have all the history and I'm just, you know, learning from them. So um, Mike and Gail had email conversations and I was part of that and, um, uh, we were trying to piece the uh, the provenance of the pe of the of the mural, and so I wrote Gail, and this is what I had. Um, he says um, that I had written in the email and says um, uh, this is the conversation between Gail and Mike, 
And he said, dear Gail, wow, what a find. It is definitely Chuck Arnett. It is the right hand section of the two glass window panes. And it's entirely possible that there's a matching left one. And so Mike says, that's fabulous. I'm going to share this conversation with Ramon over at the Historical Society who got in touch with me about this panel. So he, Gail's email to me says, Ramon, here's my query and Mike's reply. Mike says that this is a copy of the part of the mural that was on the glass window, which were eventually shattered um, at, and of which, as, as far as I know, there are no photographs. In contrast to the wall on the Harrison side of the bar, the wall side was in the Life magazine article and then was photographed in the ruins of the demolition. So I have that photograph. Oh, this is the uh, photograph of the bar um, in the Life magazine article. So as you can see, the the murals are, are, are on that wall. And then here is the part of where the murals are on the building when the building was demolished. So um, further on. So I also didn't know that Mike and Chuck Arnett were roommates at one time. So that that is just amazing. So if you if you if all of you didn't know this, um, we have a huge Chuck Arnett collection at the Historical Society. That would be another fabulous exhibition in the future. So. Uh, we are all extremely excited um, about this. Um, I know Gail has a few mu mural panels as well in her collection. And, um, you know, without f this would be an, an amazing possible exhibition in the future. So I am looking forward to it. So uh, um, I guess. I guess that's it. We could open it for uh, a little Q and A if any, everyone out there might want to, you know, say something and that sort of thing. So, um, this would be the good time. Um, Lee, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to uh, figure trying to have, out. Turn my camera back on and get myself on here. Uh, I'm just trying you. to look at our <laughs> chat panel. So, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, if anyone you know wants to put something in the chat, has a question for uh, any of our our three folks, um, I was sitting here, uh, meanwhile in the background, like chatting to these three, being like, "Oh God, I want that hat! I really, really want <laughs> Sadie Sadie's hat. The uh, synagogo uh, makes me so happy." Um, and and I love really the comment, Lee. I love the comment that you said that these looked like it was the Sistine Chapel. Oh yeah, the 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 bulldog baths. It's very uh, yeah. I don't know. Just something about the composition of it is very. Well, and that's why I said you know it was like the ruins very of Renaissance of, of Pompeii. I mean, it, there was I had I've had the opportunity to see the ruins of Pompeii and the frescoes on the brothels on the walls of of Pompeii, and they were pretty amazing. And when I came across the bulldog baths, I was like, oh my god, this is even more amazing, just because. <laughs> You know, it, it really does have so much history. So right. there you go. Yeah, well, especially with like just just thinking about it as a Sistine Chapel, it just it reminds me of the story of um, uh, not the not the the ceiling part of the Sistine Chapel, but the um, you know, the mural that that was on the wall uh, that got basically covered up as censorship by by a, a painter a couple of years later. Uh, um, you know, with drawing like basically underwear and loincloths on everyone yeah. uh, when the Catholic Church got really upset at all of the um, nudity oh, in it. And I'm, I'm just kind of <laughs> imagining that, um, you know, to to the explicitness, the explicit erotica of the Bulldog Baths murals. Um, and it's, it's making me kind of chuckle a little bit. So I, you know, I, I was talking to Isaac earlier and there is a film documentary again by Mo Molly Hogan in the collection at the archives. And uh, it is, a, it's, it's, over, it's over an hour and I think there's a couple of, of clips. And so if you um, do a small donation, you can get a copy of that. Um, Isaac will send you the copy of that film clip and you could view it. And it's really amazing because, you know, they did this documentary before they tore the, tore the bar down I mean the the 
the bathhouse down and you can see all the little details of like the paintings on the wall that couldn't be saved because you know the whole place was taken down basically and it was good that you know gail rubin and and the and the group of historical society friends and supporters decided to keep the mural the mural lived in in the in arrows for a little bit it was loaned to bus bends at arrows and then we reinforced the uh the sheetrock because you know sheetrock is 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 really fragile through the years and was reinforced with plywood so the next the next hope is to kind of be able to feature it in a in an exhibit with all the 10 panels because that would be really cool i think it'd be it'd be an amazing kind of installation so i think we're we're good um yeah, it looks like we have a question from Maddie Smith, uh, who asks, do you collect any oral histories about the pieces in the archives collections? And the, the answer to that is not directly. Um, I know that there are a lot of museums that have uh, like uh, a practice of having people talk about significant artifacts uh, that they've donated or, um, I don't know, this the the, uh, the the Portland Museum of Art also has that like cool object stories project where uh, folks can bring in their own things that they don't donate and uh, speak about their historical and archival significance. So it's a good idea. Um, yeah. But yeah, yeah, our oral histories uh, mostly, if they touch on these things, it's in, it's uh, it, it's not centrally is what I'm trying to say. Like uh, certainly, I'm sure cool. we have stuff in the oral history collection. Where, where people are talking about, oh yeah, I was at the toolbox and they had this great mural. But um, yeah, uh, it, it's an idea for the future when we have an oral history program again. Uh, that's something we're determined to do right next time we do it, uh, which means having like a, a dedicated full-time staff member, uh, which is something we, we can't currently contemplate. Um, but uh, yeah, we, we feel go big or go home oral history wise. Yeah, I agree. It's a great, I think it's a great, uh, future project if we gather the people to kind of help with provenance and history of these places. So I think we can say goodbye, but um, <laughs> in, in closing, yeah, in closing uh, we thank you all for joining us on these conversations between ourselves, between our less than perfect past and our newfound present reality that is hopefully based on fluidity, expression and queerness. And by acknowledging this history and taking from it the things that serve us best, we all hope to create a more loving future for ourselves, our community, and our allies. And I would like to thank my illustrious, never-ending illustrious group of friends and colleagues. And without you all, I would be, again, dead in water. <laughs> so Lee, Isaac, Megan, and everyone else who supports us Thank you for a wonderful evening. Good night, everybody. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us. Bye. Keep in touch.